this is just an amazing honor for me. Little old Howie getting to talk to the president of the American Dental Association, Maxine, and the president-elect, Carol. And this, this is just, we've all known each other forever. I have the great, utmost respect for you guys. Uh, I just want to start off with, we've all been doing dentistry about a quarter century um, in the same country, America. Um, where do you, if, if you were talking to 5,000 dental school graduates, how has dentistry changed in your 25 years? And what do you think it looks like for the upcoming next 25 years? Who wants to tackle that one? You, well, you tackle I, box. You know, I, 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 you know, I tell people, I think that, um, I think of my tackle box that I got that first day of dental school. And uh, I think that, you know, things have changed a lot. I think that, uh, there's a lot of opportunity out there for the new dentist. I mean, technology has certainly changed the way uh, our practices uh, are evolving. And I think there are a lot of opportunities uh, for young dentists. Um, but certainly, the young dentist entering practice today is uh, entering in, in an era that's much different from when you and Carol and I uh, practice. I mean, I think when we entered practice, it was um, a mom and pop or you know a mom and pop operation it was um, a much different environment today they're coming out of school with much more debt uh, it's, it's, it's a different environment entirely but I still see it as an uh, opportunity um, that uh, they have that I think it's a, it's still a bright future but it's a different environment certainly than the environment we entered into it's pretty exciting, don't you think, Howard? You know, when when I was in school, we couldn't even use we, we couldn't even use a calculator. That would be considered cheating. And now you can communicate, you know, with anyone in, in the world by a handheld telephone. Yeah, you know, sometimes I, you know, I have four boys. They're 19, 21, 23, and 25. And sometimes them and their friends might be saying, you know, some current issue in the United States is so bad. And I always say, well, look at the history of the country. This this country survived a civil war where almost 800,000 people were killed. They survived World War I, went into a depression, and then served World War II, and then people are all up in arms about you know, corporate dentistry or student loan debt. I'm like, well, would you rather be a dentist during the Civil War, World War I, or World War II? I mean, come on. I mean, look at this from 30,000 feet. I wanna, I wanna throw a, the most common question I get from dental students at both of you, because um, Maxine, you're a specialist, you're a periodontist. And Carol, you're a general dentist like me, correct? And yes. the most number one asked question by the dental students on Dental Town is there's nine specialties. Should I go out and be a family dentist or should I specialize? And now that 40, you know, what, what would you tell dental students when they ask you that question since you're a specialist and you're a general dentist? You know, I think that there are opportunities as a specialist or a general dentist. I think you've got to follow your passion. Um, I think you really have to follow your passion. I think that, um, you know, I have friends that are periodontists, oral surgeons, general dentists. Um, I think you have to follow your passion. And I think that if you do that and, and you love what you do, um, you will succeed um, in, in, whichever, in whichever arena you choose to practice in. Um, but you have to follow your passion and do what uh, you think you are going to love to do because I love what I do every day. Um, and I think that's the key. Um, I think you, can, you will be able to succeed um, as a general dentist. Um, I think the the technology is there for all of us. Um, so I, I think there are just exciting opportunities in, in each of the fields. Uh, you know, I see what's, I, you know, when I look at pediatric dentistry today, um, and I, I think of what it was when I graduated from dental school, it's changed so much. Um, so I think that there, you know, it, it's an ever evolving thing. Periodontics today is not what it was 30 years ago when I was a periodontist, thank goodness, I mean, it would have been a little boring, I think, if it had stayed the same for the last 30 years. So I think that that's the beauty of dentistry. It's an ever-evolving profession, thanks to the technology, thanks in, in large part to um, the science and, and the fact that 
Uh, the ADA has supported so much of the science and the technology um, and improving the standards uh, over the last, you know, hundred years. So I think whatever, whichever specialty or whether you choose general dentistry, the beauty of dentistry is uh, it isn't going to be the same in 20 or 30 years because we do evolve and we do keep up with the technology and we do improve our standards as that technology changes. And again, thanks in large part to um, the efforts of the American Dental Association. Sure, Howard, and I, you know, and just to follow on, on whether or not to be a, a, general, a general dentist or a specialist, I never regretted being a general dentist. That was all I ever wanted to be. I just wanted to be the best dentist I could, I could be. And as I, the longer I was in practice, I could focus in the areas that I, that I really wanted to focus on. But the best thing about being a general dentist is the long-term patient relations. You know, so my patients be, it, I grew with my patients and saw them have children and grandchildren and it's, and, and it was that special relationship with patients that was, which was um, something that I really enjoyed. Great answers. I, I, you're right. You know, if you have a passion and can attach a business model to it, you'll never have to work another day in your life. If I had to be a pediatric dentist, I would quit today and go apply at Taco Bell. And every time I tell a pediatric dentist that, they say, good, good, I'm glad there's people like you all stay in business. Uh, but, uh, man, periodontics, that's changed. That's, that's almost turned into implantology, hasn't it? And, and a good part of it has. And, you know, and, and I'm very fortunate because I still do a lot of periodontics as well. But, um, again, you know, there, there were no, you know, implants in my practice when I first started. And, uh, bone grafting was a very theoretical uh, concept, you know, when I first got out into practice. And so all of these things have emerged in, in the last 30 years. Um, and, and I think that really the, the main thing is the relationships I've developed with my referring dentists and, again, my patients. Right. Um, my, my patients have seen my children uh, before they were born. <laughs> Uh, develop into young adults. The same thing with uh, my patients. You know, it's it's those relationships, and I think that the the thing that Carol and I were talking about earlier is um, it, it's all about the ethics. You know, that that you start off in practice, whatever practice that is, it's about values, and um, it, it doesn't matter if you started in practice 50 years ago, uh, 30 years ago, or tomorrow. It's really upholding our values, and I think that it doesn't matter what type of dentist you are. I think the important thing is that we maintain our values as a profession, and we stick to those values, um, whether we practice as solo practitioners, whatever type of practice or specialty, or whether you're a generalist. I think it's about maintaining our values as a practitioner and as a profession. And speaking of values and, and uh, values and our profession, um, I have always been a due-paying member of the ADA my entire, since I graduated in 1987, and they're the voice of dentistry. I mean, it, once you leave our little dental bubble, uh, which is only, you know, $100 billion a year, into the American bubble, which is $17,400 billion a year, $17.4 trillion, um, everybody who's not a dentist, they... they I mean, the ADA is the voice. So I want to ask, and when people um, don't become a member, and because they have some complaint, I'm like, well, I have complaints about my mom and dad and five sisters, but we're still a family. I mean, we can, you know what I mean? I, um, t but you guys didn't just do the easy thing like I did, which is just write a check every year and be a member. Man, you guys probably volunteered a gazillion hours of free time. What, what passion about the voice of dentistry, the American Dental Association, uh, made you two commit so much time and volunteerism and, and rise all the way to the top. What, what drove that? You know, it's funny. Um, I have been one of those people who um, has been involved since kindergarten. I probably started running for office uh, in the first grade. You know, my feeling has always been um, I, I didn't want to leave something as important as my profession to someone else. I mean, there were issues, but in particular, I think um, when OSHA became a very big issue early in my career, 
Um, I thought, you know, I, I wasn't sure I liked the way my association was necessarily handling things, and I wanted a voice, and I thought, uh, I have to step up to the plate, and I have to get involved, and I thought, you know, I tell people, you know, I was on our state board of dentistry for 10 years, and I've been involved in a lot of different things, and, you know, I tell people that when you practice dentistry, um, you have a dental license, and that dental license, whether you realize it or not, is probably the most valuable um, thing that you will ever own next to your good name. And you need to protect that. And if you think that you should leave that to other people, um, I think it's a mistake. So I just thought that um, that very valuable document uh, should not be left to other people. And so I felt I needed to have a voice in protecting that. And I tell other people, I tell young people, take an active role. Don't leave it to other people. Um, I tell people that, you know, the ADA um, and your state dental association, your component dental association, you know, by being involved and uh, belonging, it allows you the comfort of being able to go to your office every day and practice dentistry and, and not have to worry about all of those other things, the regulations, um, all of the things that really you do need to worry about because, frankly, we have your back. We're that lighthouse. We're the light at the end of the tunnel, the beacon that ensures that you'll be able to do quality dentistry for your patients, really, and do the best that you can do because we're here protecting your patients and your profession. And I just felt that it was that important that that I would volunteer my time and get involved and have a say. Right, right. You know, that this profession is, it has given me more than I ever imagined. It's, it's essentially it's given me the American dream. And so the more involved I got, the more the more I wanted to give back to keep this profession as great if it were for the next generations following. So it just came out on U.S. News and World Report, still the number one profession in the country, and it's been two years in a row. So we're the greatest profession in the world and the greatest country in the world, and you're right. We're not always going to agree, but we need all dentists to stand together because we are small in, in, in the larger scheme of things. And so the more dentists that are united working to improve you know, the profession for, for ourselves and for the patients especially, that's why we're here. And, and it's not fair when three out of four of us paying the dues and one's getting a free ride for a great profession. Yeah. I mean, I tell the quarter that's not paying the dues, suck it up, buttercup, um, mm -hmm. you know, because you're a freeloader. You're a free rider. I mean, I, I really genuinely, truly believe that. Um, um, so it's funny to all you young kids out there who are maybe just seniors in middle school, when we graduated, um, OSHA came about because AIDS came about and they, I mean, I, for years, people were asking me if I sterilized my handpiece as if, as if, you know, an STD was going to be caught from a handpiece. And, uh, and so now, and then, and then I, I lived through all of that and then came the HIPAA monster, you know, that, you know, patient confidentiality. So it's always something when we came out of school, the big insurance, uh, demon was, uh, HMOs or DMO capitation, um, to younger kids. That's when they just paid you like. Ten dollars a month per person, and you had to fix everything up, no copayments. So we assume the risk, and now that's gone, and that played out, and now it's corporate dentistry. Um, but it, you know, it's always going to be something. It's always going to be something a million years from now. Um, but um, what would you what would you tell dental students who come out of school and say, "Well, I got three hundred thousand dollars in student loans, and I, I just don't have the money to join the ADA"? What would you tell those people? I would tell them they can't afford not to join. Um, you really can't afford not to join. Um, because the issues um, facing our profession are not going to become uh, less significant. Um, those issues that will face us as a profession are going to grow and become more significant. Um, they're going to need to be aware and kept up to date they need to be kept up to date, um, and they need to be involved. And, you know, it's sort of like I tell people, dentistry can be a very insular profession. Um, by getting involved and being involved, 
um, they, they will get more enjoyment out of this profession than they can imagine. Um, by going in, working, uh, either collecting a paycheck or earning a living on their own, um, it's not going to be nearly as rewarding as getting involved. Um, I really can tell you that I have given a lot of hours and put in a lot of time. Uh, I tell the story that I think I was the oral cancer screening chairperson for my component society for nine years, and I love that job. And I thought it was one of the best jobs I've had in organized dentistry. And um, I was glad that I spent those nine years doing that. Um, and I can tell you that every single job I've done, I've gotten more from that job than I've put in. And I can tell them that they, they need to get involved. If they want to have a really enjoyable, rewarding career, and get the most out of it, and I don't mean fin just financially, I mean really the most enjoyable, rewarding experience in their professional lives, the best way to do that is to get involved in organized dentistry, and they really can't afford not to be a member. Don't you think it's a small price to pay for the, the investment of time and money that they put in to, to, to help them to achieve their, their professional potential? So I think it is a very small price to pay but as, as Maxine says, the more involved a dentist is, the more they value you know, what organized dentistry is doing for them at the, at the state, local, and national levels. I mean, when I graduated from dental school, my mom and dad and sisters were crying. That's mm -hmm. that profession, you know, that profession. Um, I want to I wanna, um, I, I wanna say what was the best value for me for the ADA, seriously. Uh, for me, um, it was you know, getting out of your individual office and going to these meetings and meeting all these social friends. And then I want to tell you the biggest hidden jewel, and we'll ask a specialist this question. Um, you know, all you people that are paying for these $5,000 weekend courses on like perio or implants or whatever, whatever, I would be sitting at a table at an ADA meeting or whatever, and you make friends, and then, and then you just ask your periodontist, could I come in and watch you? I never had anyone say no. I mean, I mean, the um, if you say I got a FMX and study models, I'm clueless, and everybody would say, "Well, just come on by." So you could get literally all the free CE in the world just from your nine specialist buddies um, that you meet at any meeting that you guys put on. And and I'll tell you another thing, it's the camaraderie. Yes. Um, you know, I, I I'll say dues X number of dollars, camaraderie, friendship, moral support. Um, is priceless. You know, when Carol and I got out, there were not as many women in dentistry. Um, and so we'd go to a meeting and, you know, there'd be a few women and we would talk about um, issues with working, raising our families, um, you know, going to PTA meetings. Um, the, the, you know, the issues that might seem like nothing to some people, but for us, it was difficult. You know, there were it was difficult at times, and we helped each other. It could be even um, offering to babysit uh, when somebody you know got stuck. The babysitter didn't show up. Um, so you know, there were those things. Or I tell the story about a guy who belonged to my component dental association that I really didn't know, who we read his office burnt down, and how many people offered to lend them their office free of charge. I heard of a woman, um, I think it was three years ago, the ceiling collapsed in her office and she had no place to practice. And as you know, as you mentioned, I've been traveling a lot. So I said, come use my office. And she said, well, let me pay you. I said, why would I do that? No one's using my office on these days that I'm not there. Just come and you bring your staff, use the office, I'm not there. And she couldn't believe that I wouldn't take money from her. But that happens in my component all the time. It happens in my state regularly. These are the kinds of things that you can't put a dollar amount right. on. Right. That camaraderie and friendship where we come together and help each other because it's the right thing to do. I want, and, to, ask, I want, I want to ask you a question that you just brought up. You, you said you know, that you, you brought up that you two are women, okay? Um, when I was a freshman in dental school, the senior class had one girl in the class. And I don't, and the class before her didn't have any. And now the dental school graduating class last year was 45% women. 
Uh, I don't think I'm qualified as a man to say, are there any issues? I mean, what are, are there any issues different being a woman dentist? And, and how has, how do you think dentistry has changed being from the one, we, I mean, literally token woman in the class to now 45% of the class. And some say it'll be over 50% within yes. a decade. Right. Does that change anything or what, what is that like? I, you know, it's funny, you know, it, it, it's funny, um, some of the statistics we looked at, like with student debt, for example, what we found is that women do sometimes make different decisions. For example, um, student debt didn't seem to impact their decisions as much about um, going into, um, you know, the military or, or choosing careers in public health, public health or government. Yeah. Um, so. Women do make different decisions than men, you know, in terms of the choices they make. Um, they're not influenced as much about, um, let's say, debt doesn't influence their decision as much in terms of uh, career choices. Um, and for years, people were making assumptions that women wouldn't necessarily work as many hours as men. But in fact, um, our statistics don't necessarily bear that out either. So I don't know you know, how it will affect the profession long term. Um, but I think that, you know, in fact, it's, it's, it's just the fact that our profession is changing, not just in terms of women. I think we're just becoming a much more diverse profession. The demographic is changing. It's but, um, but just to be, just to be clear, you, you said you're, you are seeing some changes in that debt doesn't influence what specialty they go into or <laughs> For example, the decision making, like when, when we looked at whether debt would impact um, whether dentists would pick public health or um, teaching or those careers, we found it didn't seem to impact women as much. They, if that's what they wanted to do, that's what they still would, you know, choose to do. So again, men and women may make decisions in a slightly different way. That's what the data seemed to indicate. that men and women may make career um, choices in a different way. So there is some difference um, in, in terms of career choices um, in, in that regard. Um, but I think that in the end, um, men and women are going to practice dentistry in very similar ways. Um, you know, I think most dentists um, ultimately, I think 58% of all dentists would like to eventually own their own practices. Um, I think that 58 percent. Uh, I think that's what our statistics still, show. It's still very high. It's still, still very, very high. high. But yeah, I think that some of the the differences, of course, is if if you, the woman is the one having the children, and so we're seeing a, a an impact, a little bit of an impact in leadership positions. You know, where where women with young children may not get involved as much because they can't. You know, so trying to balance profession and personal life and then getting involved in, in leadership opportunities, there, there is a difference. Or they may postpone involvement in leadership positions, right. um, you know, till they're a little further along in their careers. Um, so there may be those differences. Um, but I think that, I think the profession is going to still be very strong. I think that, um, you're going to see, what we are seeing are a lot more women involved in academia. When we were at more the deans, deans um, right. conference, we saw a number of women deans. I know when I was in dental school, there were very few women um, in you know, leadership positions in dental school. Um, today, when you go to the deans meetings at IDEA, you see a lot of women um, moving up into leadership in uh, IDEA and academia. So. I want to I want to ask you the most personal question um, that a female dentist um, could address, and not me. So you said you were nine years on the committee for oral cancer screening, and when I was in dental school, oral cancer was just from smoking and drinking, and now we're being shown the evidence that oral pharyngeal cancer could be really related to HPV, um, but I just don't see any dentist asking their patients, have you been vaccinated for HPV? I find it bizarre that as a doctor of dental surgery, I can't give the HPV vaccine. I find it equally bizarre that I can go to Walgreens and have a pharmacy tech give me a flu shot, 
and I see my patients twice as often as they see their physician and I can't give them a flu shot. So I want to ask you, so I want to ask you this very private thing. I'm reading research that girls are getting more oral, young girls in college are getting more oral pharyngeal cancer than men. Um, is this something dentists should be talking to mom and dad? If, if, if when little kids come in that are 10, 12 years old and you're, you're looking at, you know, a 10 year old girl, you, you know, an HPV can cause cervical cancer. You know, it now can cause oral pharyngeal. Um, is this something we should talk about? I mean, aren't we the physicians of the mouth? And why can't I give a vaccine for HPV? And why can't I give a flu shot? And, and furthermore, is that even a national issue like OSHA and HIPAA? Or is that just going to be a 50 state by state battling out or even crazier water fluoridation fought out in towns as small as 5,000? I know, I know that, was a, the big, that was a lot of questions rolled into one. I state by state. It's, a, it's unfortunately, once again, one of those state by state battles because, again, look what happened in Illinois recently with the flu shot, you know, where, uh, in fact, the medical board fought them, um, you know, in terms of giving the flu shot. And you're right. You can go to just about any Walgreens and get just about any vaccine you want. Um, but I think that's a very relevant point. We talked about this at the prevention summit last year where, um, you know, just educating and vaccinating um, could prevent possibly, I think it's 5,000 um, deaths a year from um, various cancers, you know, just by vaccinating, you know, um, you know, increased awareness and vaccination against, you know, HPV. Um, so, you know, I, I think that this is something that needs to be discussed more. We had this discussion at yes. the Prevention Summit last year because I do think that this is something that dentists um, should be aware of and should be looking at and discussing. And I do think it brings, it, it brings to point um, something that, you know, we have talked about. Um, you know, there are a number of types of screenings that I think dentists should and could be doing because basically I think there's somewhere in the neighborhood of 20 to 30 million patients a year that dentists see that physicians don't see every year that could be screened for all sorts of things, hypertension, diabetes, um, that we could be seeing. We, sh we, we, we could be really saving easily $100 million a year in, in terms of medical costs. And there are probably 100 million people that physicians see a year that don't see a dentist. So I do think that this really shows that we should be expanding our focus um, and saying that we need to have a broader discussion with our healthcare colleagues about ways that we should be cooperating and looking about looking at how dentists can um, really improve their patients' general health outcomes, whether it be HPV, hypertension, diabetes, um, because we are very knowledgeable and, and it should be about improving our patients' overall health. So I agree with you, whether it be, um, again, um, flu vaccines, wh whatever it is, um, we are certainly capable of doing those things. And again, there, as, as you said, if there are 20 million patients in America that see us who haven't seen a physician and we can help improve their overall health outcomes, I don't see why we're not doing that. Because we, access to care is just as important or even more maybe than affordability in a lot of issues. Mm -hmm. and, and again, sometimes, you know, there are so many reasons why people don't seek care. You know, a lot of it's fear, a lot of it's ignorance. Um, a lot of it is, um, you know, people think they're well, you know, whether or in the, in the same reason I think a lot of people don't go to the dentist. We just had, um, you know, our um, Health Policy Institute did some deep dive in that 25 to 40 year cohort to find out why they're not going to the dentist. And many of them said they're not going because they don't need to go. Um, now, you know, they think they're healthy. Um, and why is that? You know, they went to the dentist when they were children, twice a year, their parents took them. Many of them had the advantage of fluoride in their drinking water. 
Many of them had uh, no need for restorations. And in their mind, they don't need to see a dentist because they, they had healthy, you know, healthy teeth, no fillings, no cavities. Um, and they didn't understand that that was probably due to the fact that they had very good maintenance of their oral health over the years. So now in their mind, well, you know, I'm healthy, I don't need to go. Um, and so, you know, I think it's about education and explaining to people the need for prevention um, and that good health and good dental health require um, preventive maintenance care. And so I think that we have a lot of work ahead of us in re-educating people about the importance of preventive maintenance care. I said to a young man in my office yesterday um, who hadn't been to a dentist in four years, he was in his 20s, well, why haven't you gone? He said, well, I never had any cavities and, you know, until my gums started to bother me, um, I didn't think I needed to go. I was healthy. And, you know, it's this false sense of security that we created, I think, in that, that group of people that... Um, they didn't need to maintain that health. And so I think we're going to have to start re-educating people. You know we have a, a website for consumers. It, it's mouthhealthy.org to answer those questions. But you're right. We need to have some sensitive conversations with our patients so they, they understand the link between, you know, oral cancer, as you said, and, um, and, and the need to come in for regular, regular visits. What I, what I, it's mouthhealthy.org. And what I want to say to the viewers about mouthhealthy.org, a lot of dentists, um, they don't have the time to really create content for their Facebook posts. But what I love about Facebook is all you got to do is go to mouthhealthy.org um, and copy a line about the, the title of something and the URL, drop that in your Facebook, and then the Facebook pulls up the splash page. So you get this neat, bright, beautiful image and a, a fun headline about something that, you know, brushing, flossing twice a day, oral cancer, everything. So you have this beautiful picture in your Facebook and a beautiful headline and it gets lots of likes and comments and visits and you can totally keep your Facebook page alive just yeah. by posting links to uh, mouthhealthy.org. So congratulations on that. I want, but I want to I, ask a, um, you know, I don't, I don't want to go into politics, but I, I'm going to have to ask the, uh, the crazy question and the, the the crazy question is for me personally it's kind of demoralizing when i'm practicing dentistry in the united states and the three fastest growing diseases around the world are dental cavities obesity and diabetes and i see the government subsidizing corn farmers making high fructose corn syrup to so many billions of dollars that that i'm standing in line at airports and restaurants, and I have personally heard a dozen kids in my lifetime say, well, the Coke's cheaper than the bottled water, yes. and the bottled water is a dollar, and the 64-ounce Thirst Buster is 69 cents with free refills. Why, and then, and then on the water fluoridation issue, every time I turn around, it's like every time we get a city to put it in, someone pulls it out. So it's always at 70, 30, 75, 25, I mean, I mean, what can, what, what can dentists do to tell the federal government that you can't subsidize the stuff that makes cavities, diabetes, diabetes, and obesity? I mean, how do you stop high fructose corn syrup being cheaper than bottled water? I, it's going to take a coalition. You know, it's, it, it, dentistry will have to, we, we have to align ourselves with other health professionals and, and lobby at the, at the federal level. It's, it's going to take all of the health care professionals to work together to show the importance. Yes. We can save so much money by preventing the, the, the disease before it even starts, but we, we can't do it alone. So that's where the ADA has to work collaboratively with other health organizations. Great Absolutely. Help. We can't do that alone. That's a, I mean, that's, I don't know if you've noticed um, when even municipalities or states have tried to do things to, um, to make a difference in that, in that arena, like the mayor of New York City who tried to limit the size of a drink, and he was like laughed out of town like he was a communist. And it's like, well, at least he's throwing a dart at a fire, and the fire, you know. Something. It was, you know, it's, it's very difficult. Um, 
But I will say this. Um, I read last week that Wendy's will no longer <laughs> put soda in their kids' meals. And because I'm a very corny person, I took the time to go to their website and send a, a note commending them for doing that because I felt that at least one company did the right thing. They're, they're not going to put sodas in their kids' meals. And I, I know it sounds crazy, but I'm that kind of person who thought at least one fast food chain was doing the right thing, and I had to make a personal comment and say, thank you, Wendy's. That is cool. And CVS quit selling cigarettes. Yes. So that you was see, interesting. So, you know, I, I know it sounds crazy, but, you know, maybe it takes one fast food company to start putting bottled water or milk in their fast food meal, and maybe people have to start stepping up and saying, I'm taking my kids to Wendy's because they're doing the right thing, you know, and that's what you have to do. And maybe you have to start encouraging people to go to Wendy's because they're not putting soda, you know, in, in the kid's meal. Well, you know why Wendy's has square patties? Yeah. <laughs> because and they don't... And the nuggets, you know. They, but... they have square patties because they don't cut any corners. Right. And, uh, <laughs> hey, I, I, want to, I want to tell you one last thing. I'll, I'll only get you for four more minutes. Uh, um, I want to ask you one other question. Um, I, I get into about a dozen dental schools a year lecturing to the junior, senior class. Um, I always do that free. I, I just love it. I, I just absolutely love it. And I want to tell you my own personal um, obvious difference that I see, more obvious than now that the class is half women and half men, um, as opposed to our generation, they all talk about environmentalism, recycling supplies, green, eco-friendly. And, and I asked them, what kind of office you want to have? And our generation would have said cosmetics or implants or reconstruction. And these dentists tell me, I want to have the first dental office in my town off the grid. And I want to, I want to have the first dental office that doesn't leave a footprint. And I'm telling you, our wow. next generation, their environmentalism more than the uh, than I mean it, it's it's fun and it's neat but man are they passionate about eco friendly dental practices and you guys are huge in the uh, uh, the water fluoridation arena every dentist I know that's tried to get water fluoridation in their town and it was all your materials and pamphlets and supplements and I know you're big in ocean hip and all that but um, Carol are you you're from California that's the probably the most hippie uh, environmental um, um, you know, save the, save the whale. Um, do you, do you see this movement growing and do you plan to, uh, talk about eco-friendly dental practices? You know, they've been talking about it for a long time I, it, within the state. And, and I, if you visited the Oregon Health Sciences Center, did you, have you seen that school? Yes. I think they're the, the first, was it a platinum lead, uh, school in the country? No, they're very green. So I, I do think that's going to be a trend in, um, in the future, for sure. This, the millennials really care about the future of, of, of our environment and, and maintaining it for, for everyone to enjoy. So that's interesting that, that you're hearing that all over the country. Absolutely. It's just, uh, I mean, just, just passionate. They, they seem to be as passionate about that as our generation was about a, a water fluoridation or, you know, or you know, all the battles we fought 25 years ago. So, so I'll just, I'll just end it on this uh, closing for you because I know you guys are busier than I'll ever be, and thank you so much for your time. I'll, I'll just, I just want to end on one thing. I want you to pretend right now that your daughter just graduated from dental school an hour ago. What would be your advice to your daughter just entering our profession now? I, I'd say keep learning. I mean, that, that's, you know, that, that's just the first day of their, uh, of their professional life, and you just got to keep learning because things are changing all the time and just keep up with the time, stay ahead, and create your future. Create your own future. Yeah. I would probably tell my daughter, uh, <laughs> thank your parents uh, for all they've done to get you here. <laughs> and, uh, and remember, your parents gave you their good name. Do everything in your power to abide by the ADA's code of ethics to ensure that you do nothing in your career to sully that good name, abide by those 
ethical, you know, that code of ethics and keep us proud. And I just want to close saying, uh, first of all, thank you to you two for all that you have done and continue to do for dentistry and so much of it. Um, unpaid, all volunteerism uh, while your colleagues are in their office doing another thousand dollar root canal or another thousand dollar crown. You're always in some committee not getting paid anything but a cold cup of coffee and a styrofoam cup. Uh, but I, I, want to, I want to tell the locals that, you know, I, I just want to say this to all the dentists out there, especially the one fourth that I remember. What would you think of a fireman who was retiring and the speech went, you know, every year that Fred was the chief fireman, more homes burned down every year than the year before. In fact, you know, by next year, there won't be any homes. What would you say to the retiring police officer if you said to him, you know, ever since he was the, the, the chief of police, every year there was more murders than the year before, you know, you, you, you throw him out of town. But as dentists, so many of our towns every year has more cavities, more obesity, more diabetes than the year before. And at the end of the day, we are firemen. We're putting out disease. We are, we are police officers. We're, we're trying to round up the gram-negative anaerobes. And Carol is from the great state of California and Maxine's from New Jersey. But at your local level, you got to start getting involved. You got to get the right to vaccinate for HPD. You got to get fluoride in the water. You you got to get flu shots out there because at the end of the day we're firemen and and everybody in America forgets that. Yeah, you always hear in the news of the the firemen in the 117 biggest towns in America where 51% of Americans live and they all have benefits and union retirement. But the firemen in the 19,022 rural America where the other 49% of America lives, those are all volunteer firemen. They do it and they don't even get paid. Like you guys are volunteer um, American Dental Association firemen. So join the association. I hope I'm guilt tripping you and don't be a freeloader. Don't let three us three pay for you to get a free ride and join and get in a local level because a lot of the issues that these two ladies are dealing about, um, like say they just told us they have to be fought state by state by state by state. Water fluoridation, flu shots, vaccinations. And uh, thank you for making this profession so great that my mom and dad cried when I graduated. Hey, thank you, Howard. Thank Thanks you, for Howard. supporting the thank you. organized dentistry. We appreciate, appreciate it. it. All right, I can't wait to see you again sometime soon. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, bye-bye.